Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at a video by David Reeves of David Reeves Ministries. You may know him from his evolution song. But here he is talking about a self-feeding mechanism that can drive relatively rapid evolution. And sorry, that song has some real stupidity behind it, but it's a bit of an earworm, so allow me to remove it from your head with this. Yes. Yes, I am evil. Now let's go! The atheist Richard Dawkins once proposed a very interesting idea. He said that he believed that ducks and hawks evolved quickly through a self-feeding mechanism of necessity. Dawkins may have been the first to coin the term evolutionary arms race in his paper in 1979, but it was a working hypothesis from as early as 1973 being dubbed the Red Queen's Hypothesis by Lee Van Valen. And the only reason I bother bringing this up is because creationists seem obsessed with attacking ideas that originate with the more prominent proponents of what they consider the evolutionist worldview, like Dawkins. So instead of finding out exactly where these ideas actually originated, just mention that it was Dawkins because Van Valen isn't anywhere near as well known as Dawkins is. And I think this stems from the desire to see evolution as a religion, because religions need people in charge of determining doctrine and stuff like that, because apparently God can't be bothered to do it himself. So obviously the most famous people who promote evolution are the ones who determine the evolutionist doctrine, right? I'm also going to skip a bunch of the video because he just explains what an evolutionary arms race is, and he does a decent job of it but takes too long. Essentially an arms race is when two competing species experience pressure to develop traits to outcompete each other. It can be symmetrical, with the selection pressure acting in the same direction on all species involved, such as trees experiencing pressure to grow taller to access more sunlight, or it can be asymmetrical, where the pressures are related but act differently on the different organisms, such as the toxicity of the rough-skinned newt pressuring the garter snakes to become resistant to the toxin, which then pressures the newt to become more toxic. So logically, it seems that self-feeding works. That we could apply the same to biological evolution. Well, it is an analogy and as such is imperfect, but yes, we could. But then, with the way you're phrasing this, it almost seems like you think that we based the idea of an evolutionary arms race on the examples of human arms races rather than discovering evolutionary arms races and then using the analogy of human arms races to help us understand what's being discussed that a hawk and its prey could create a bit of a rapid spiral of development to outcompete. One gets faster and better at evading, and the other gets keener eyes and sharper talons. The cycle continues. Yeah, basically. It seems logical, right? Well, just because something makes sense doesn't make it true. And remember, the opposite is also true. Just because something doesn't make intuitive sense does not make that thing false. Keep that in mind next time you're tempted to say something like this. It is amazing there are people so narrow-minded to believe that this universe isn't created with purpose. Narrow-minded enough to discount the possibility of creation by God, but at the same time believe in something as far-fetched as a chance explosion 14 billion years ago, creating the immense and beautiful universe that we see every time we open our eyes. But let's look more closely at the proposed self-feeding upwards rapid evolution and we're going to see that this is just an average piece of intellectual pseudoscience. What is intellectual pseudoscience as opposed to normal pseudoscience? And can something really be called pseudoscience when it has dozens of peer-reviewed papers published in reputable journals over the course of the last four decades? It's not like this is some integral part of the theory of evolution. So even in your weird world where the entire scientific community made up of literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of scientists, somehow are all involved in a massive conspiracy to cover up the idea that evolution never happened, if there were problems with the evolutionary arms race model, they could have easily come up with a better explanation, published that, and then played it off as one of the many examples of the scientific process having built-in self-correcting mechanisms. But then of course if they had done that, that would have just obviously been one of those times when scientists changed their minds, because changing minds to account for new data is a bad thing in the creationist worldview. Damned if you do, damned if you don't, I guess. In fact, the only examples Dawkins gives are based on human intellect. Mankind's brilliance at being creative. Wait, the only examples of an evolutionary arms race, which you are repeatedly calling self-feeding for the sake of your bad joke in the title, are examples of human intelligence? Are you sure? 
Or are those examples of things that Dawkins compared it to in order to foster understanding through analogy? As I said earlier, all analogies are necessarily imperfect, so will break down at some point. If they didn't, they would cease to be analogies and would just be the thing that they were analogizing. This just happens to be one of the places where this particular analogy breaks down. There is no conscious intent behind an evolutionary arms race. That's just an easier way for us to think about it. That's right, us creating better technology are forced to design scientific programs to compete. Humans working with the same above average brains but using teamwork to work more rapidly. All of these are prime examples of our creativity, drive, and design. Nothing more. Yeah, okay, this seems to be just you saying that analogies aren't perfect, therefore the evolutionary arms race isn't a thing, thus demonstrating your complete lack of understanding about how analogies work. Now let's move on to the nitty gritty and see if there is any way to assume that this would work on a biological level. Hopefully now you actually delve into some of the science rather than just complain that the analogy is imperfect. When talking about evolution, even the most adamant professor would admit that they rely on mutations, adaptation, and natural selection to do the work. Why are you saying that as if it's some bad thing? Are we trying to hide the fact that those are some of the mechanisms for evolution? No, we are not. So why do you phrase it as though we are? Let's take natural selection. If we speed that up, what would happen? Well, natural selection is closely linked to the survival of the fittest. It's an idea that does have plenty of merit. For instance, the largest grizzly bears are pretty fit, and they survive pretty well. You seem to be misunderstanding the phrase survival of the fittest. It's an easy enough mistake to make, as it was coined more than a century ago and language has changed since then. It's not just about being bigger or stronger, it's about being the best fit for the environment that you're in. The term fitness was not about what we consider fitness today, superior strength, more muscle, etc. It was simply about how much more reproductive success an organism would have. So today we would say that someone who works out at the gym every day and has a well-toned body with plenty of muscle and eats healthy is more fit than me with my dad bod and cookie obsession. But if that fitness buff has no kids, then in the Darwinian sense, I am more fit because I have three kids so have had more reproductive success. But the way natural selection supposedly selects is by nature weeding out the weak. And by that, I mean death. Yes, organisms that cannot survive long enough to reproduce have their genes removed from the gene pool. Some of their genes can survive in other members of the species, but the ones that were detrimental and contributed to that organism's early demise will gradually be weeded out. If we rapidly speed up the death of our example hawks and ducks, it's not going to speed up their reproduction or their birth rate. I'm curious as to why you feel the need to speed up their deaths. And if you're speeding up their deaths, why do you get to not speed up their reproductive rates? Or are you saying that the new advantage for one species or the other would speed up the death rate of its opposing species? Because that is true. But it is such a gradual thing that you don't need to speed up the reproductive rates. But even though you don't need to speed up the reproductive rates, speeding them up could be one of the advantages that are selected for in these arms race scenarios, which is actually one of the main reasons why prey animals usually have more babies than the predators. So yes, in some cases speeding up the rate of death due to predation can increase the rate of reproduction in the affected species. It's going to effectively cull the species to extinction. If left unchecked, that is a possibility. But remember, this is an incredibly gradual process that takes place over the course of several generations. If one hawk has only slightly better eyesight than that of the other hawks, that hawk will be more successful in catching prey than the other hawks. This will allow it to live longer and potentially reproduce more. Its offspring then inherit its better eyesight, making more hawks that can catch more prey, which then puts selection pressure on the prey. The ones that are just a little bit better at hiding will live longer to reproduce, and the better at hiding babies will have the same advantage until they are caught by hawks that have just a little bit better eyesight than the previous generation. It is a very slow process, and in this specific example, hawks prey on so many different species that the possibility of them hunting any one species to extinction is fairly minimal. So natural selection is not going to work. Well, not in your crazy sped up supermutation oversimplified hypothetical, but in the real world it works just fine. What about mutations? What do you think that natural selection was selecting for or against? Why are you talking as if these are all completely independent categories when they are actually working in tandem? Well, if we increase the mutation rate, then it's also going to increase the death rate, as most mutations are at best non-beneficial, at worst lethal, and the ones that don't kill will aggregate over time and then destroy the species. That's not how mutations work. 
Yes, neutral mutations do accumulate over time, but it's not some ticking time bomb that will one day blow up and destroy the entire species in one fell swoop. They just kind of sit there continuing to do nothing, providing us with an excellent mechanism for molecular clock dating. Negative mutations are the most common and are selected against, but again, they are not usually instantly fatal. If a mutation is only mildly detrimental, it can still allow the organism to reproduce with non-mutated members of the species, providing the opportunity for the mutation to be counterbalanced by the healthy genes of its mate. But even if the negative mutation ends up being dominant and is passed on, it's not an instant death sentence, it's just that organisms with this negative mutation will not have as much reproductive success as those without it, so it will very gradually be culled out of the species. Species. And conversely, a beneficial mutation will only slightly increase the organism's reproductive success, which will cause the beneficial mutation to gradually spread through the species. So let's say we zap the hawk with radiation and we get a rapid mutation rate with a few beneficial mutations. Well, unless you happen to zap the duck with the same radiation gun, you're not going to get an equal acceleration of mutations in the duck. Okay, but why are we zapping them with radiation guns? Which evolutionary biologist has proposed doses of radiation as the mechanism behind evolutionary arms races? We're not talking about huge improvements that happen every single generation. We're talking about small changes that take centuries to accumulate in the fastest cases. So it will never become a self-feeding chain reaction. No, your radiation gun hypothesis will not become a self-feeding chain reaction. So it's a good thing that nobody anywhere thinks that's how any of this works. Well, we still got one more that could salvage the naturalistic idea of rapid evolutionary upward self-feeding, and that's adaptation. And again, you're looking at these as if they are mutually exclusive. An adaptation is defined as a feature that is produced by natural selection for its current function. So if a mutation produces a feature that is beneficial, then this feature will be selected for by natural selection, and so will become an adaptation. These three things work together, not in isolation. Adaptation is a switching on and off of genetic switches. It's already built into the DNA, the makeup of the creature. In a sense, yes. When we look at features in order to describe them as an adaptation, we are looking at features that are currently fully developed for a specific purpose. For instance, feathers on a bird are an adaptation that allows them to fly. If we only had flightless feathered theropods, then we would call feathers an adaptation for warmth, much like fur. So when looking at adaptations, we are looking at how the features of an organism are currently performing their functions, not how they used to perform or what they might become in the future. But that does not change the fact that mutations and natural selection are two of the mechanisms that help species adapt over time. The genes are expressing themselves differently. And do you know what force decides which of the different expressions of genes is more favorable and becomes more dominant in a population? That would be natural selection. Now it gets a bit deeper than this when we start distinguishing between the phenotype and the genotype levels. There's a chance that it could provide the creature with some advantage in a given circumstance. Maybe we figured it out. But how do you speed up genetic changes? Again with your obsession with speeding things up. When speaking in evolutionary terms, fast can be thousands of years. We don't need your hypothetical super acceleration to make this work. In fact, so far your hypothetical super acceleration is the only thing that would stop it from working. So yeah, if you insist on completely misunderstanding the time frame, evolutionary arms races don't necessarily make sense. The duck can't mentally go, I need to develop different length wings to dodge these hawks more effectively. No, they can't. And that's not what anyone has ever proposed. I have only ever heard arguments like this when creationists are building straw men of evolution. It's just that if a different size wing is more advantageous for the duck to avoid the hawk, then the ducks who have those different size wings will live longer and have more babies. If their babies have a genetic mutation that makes their wings even better at avoiding hawks, then those babies will have more babies too, and so on and so forth. No conscious decision necessary, just the fact that the hawk will have a harder time catching those ducks. Nothing would happen. Evolution wouldn't magically take place, and it certainly wouldn't magically set a more rapid pace just because the duck realized its need. The duck's conscious realization has nothing to do with it, and nobody has ever suggested otherwise except for creationists. Do you honestly think that evolutionary biologists actually believe that an organism's individual willpower is the driving force behind evolution? Because that would just be ridiculous. 
ducks falling out of the sky as hawk prey wouldn't magically stimulate genetic changes in the ducks that hadn't been attacked yet. Oh my god, you are so close! No, it would not stimulate new changes, but the ones that are able to evade the attack for whatever reason would be genetically different from the ones who got caught, meaning that their genes are the ones that get passed on. So any changes they had to their genetic code, whether it be through mutation, genetic drift, recombination, whatever, would be selected for by virtue of the fact that they are the ones that didn't get eaten by the hawks. You just need to put those pieces together in your mind. Just turn that one little piece around a bit so that it lines up with the others and boom, you got it. No known natural process is going to create a self-feeding rapid evolutionary chain. Except you literally just described how it would work. You just didn't quite make the connection that it's all three of the items you're discussing working in tandem. You came so painfully close with that last comment, but it just slipped right through your fingers. The more you tighten your grip, Tark, the more star systems will slip through your fingers. Bottom line, is self-feeding real? Absolutely. It's the end product of mental stimulation, a mind, an intelligence. But a rapid spiral of self-feeding upwards biological evolution in the natural world? That's pseudoscience. Pseudoscience that has made accurate predictions over a century ago. Yeah, they didn't call it an evolutionary arms race back then, but that is exactly how the Xanthopan Morgani Predicta's existence was predicted. They found an orchid on Madagascar with an unusually long spur. By observing its long spur, Darwin was able to predict that a moth would exist with an unusually long proboscis. He made this prediction in 1862. Alfred Russell Wallace even drew pictures in 1867 of what the moth would look like, and had narrowed the prediction down to not just any old moth, but a subspecies of the sphinx moth, the Xanthopan morgani. It wasn't discovered until 1903, and there are examples of evolutionary arms races going on all over the world, across all areas of life. Trees are taller than they reasonably should be, because the taller trees block sunlight from the shorter ones, so the selection pressure is to grow taller. Moths develop methods to detect a bat's echolocation clicks, and develop methods for avoiding the bats, while bats develop better methods of catching the moths, and the list goes on. A clever device created only in the brain of a mere mortal to try and explain something that he can't quite grasp. Well, unfortunately, the only minds we have access to are those of mere mortals. I'm sure you think the Bible is how we access the mind of God, but it is so full of problems and contradictions that it can't be reasonably shown to be the result of the mind of God. I mean, it says that God is not the author of confusion, but then there are literally thousands of Christian denominations. Each denomination has a slightly different interpretation of the Bible from all the other ones. If it were actually a perfect and inerrant book authored by an all-powerful and all-knowing God, then it wouldn't be possible to misinterpret it, so there would be only one denomination. And if it did need clarifying on something, then God should be able to do that himself. And I'm sure every church that has split off from its parent denomination will have some story about how God revealed that their interpretation is the correct one, but the fact remains that they can't all be correct, and an all-powerful, all-knowing God would know how to let us know which one is correct. It goes against everything that we know through science and observation. Yeah, it sure does. Which is why the scientific literature is filled with examples of evolutionary arms races and studies on how these different arms races occur. Wait a minute, that doesn't quite fit. It's ludicrous to even imagine. Well, just because something makes sense doesn't make it true. It's ludicrous to even imagine. Well, just because something makes sense doesn't make it true. Well done. You couldn't even get through your video where you point out that making intuitive sense isn't what makes something true, without appealing to intuitive sense. So why did Dawkins and other atheists come up with such creative mental rescuing devices to explain what they observe in the natural world? They're not creative rescuing devices, it's simply where the evidence points. Is it perhaps because they're looking only to their precious Darwinian mechanisms to explain the entire collection of life on this planet? It's not so much that we're looking only to Darwinian mechanisms, it's that evolution is the only mechanism that has been proposed that does adequately explain the vast diversity of life on the planet. Your proposition of magic is completely unfalsifiable and is therefore scientifically useless. They've purposely discounted and disregarded any other explanation. Nope. We've just accepted the one that works best with the data we have available. If God did it some other way, then it's God's fault that he didn't provide evidence that made it look like he did it another way. I think that's a detriment to the scientific community. Now, even if someone doesn't agree with my position, specific intelligent design by the God of the Bible, 
It's always curious how willing they are to accept a magical, anti-naturalistic principle like self-feeding to explain their beliefs. Is it really magical if we can scientifically describe the mechanisms of how it works, observe it happening in real time in nature, and use it to make accurate predictions? I don't think so. Whereas you propose actual literal magic of a magical being saying an incantation which just poofed everything into existence out of nothing, that's literally what the Genesis account says happened. Well, chapter 1 anyway. Chapter 2 has him making man like an ancient Semitic golem spell, which doesn't necessarily require an incantation. Well, that's it for this video. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Michael Thompson, who writes, And another weak year has passed and you still haven't demonstrated chemicals to life abiogenesis. You're absolutely right. I have not demonstrated abiogenesis. Because I'm a fucking YouTuber, not a scientist. I'll educate you on the matter, but I don't have a lab in which to do it. Also, just because something happened in nature does not mean that scientists are definitely for sure able to repeat it in the lab with our current technology. We know that the sun is a giant sustained fusion reactor, but we have yet to build a fusion reactor ourselves that can last for more than a fraction of a second. Does the fact that we don't have fusion completely figured out yet mean that the sun doesn't exist? So remember to follow me on Twitter and Facebook and support me on Patreon. See you next time.